Amen. Amen. He is able. Thank you, band. Well, we're finishing up our series of the Thou Shall Nots. We did Do Not Judge, Do Not Fear, Do Not Doubt, Do Not Sin. And today, Do Not Worry. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 6. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Well, death was walking towards the city one morning, and a man bumped into death and said, Oh, what are you doing? Death replied, I'm going to take a hundred people. The man said, That's horrible. Death said, That's what I do. Man hurried ahead, went into the city, and told everybody about death's plan. And then as the evening came and he saw the news, the news was this, a thousand people died in the city today. The man went out and found death leaving town and he said, you you told me you were only going to take a hundred people. Why did a thousand die? And death shrugged. He said, I only took a hundred. Worry took all the rest. Worry. It has this way of killing us. Literally. A worry will cost you much physically. Uh, the doctors Minerth and Meyer conclude that anxiety is the underlying cause of most psychiatric problems. Dr. Charles Mayo explained worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the entire nervous system. I have never met a person who died of overwork, but I have known a lot who died of worry. Statistics at the Mayo Clinic indicate that 85% of their total caseload were directly or indirectly due to mental stress. In fact, a leading medical journal asks, is stress the cause of all disease? You know, at the beginning of the last century, bacteria was the central focus. Right now, we're worried about our stress load. It's replaced bacteria. In fact, one of the leading doctors in our country said 70% of all medical patients could cure themselves if they only got rid of their worries. Okay? Medical science is closely tied our worry to heart trouble, blood pressure problems, ulcer, thyroid malfunction, migraine headaches, a host of stomach disorders. An estimated 25 million of high blood pressure due to stress, 8 million stomach ulcers. Every week, 112 million take medication for stress-related symptoms. Now, as I tell you this, you're probably all getting worried, okay? (laughs) Do you know what the culprit behind worry is? It's the self. Remember when Jesus says you cannot serve two masters? In this world, the greatest taskmaster we serve happens to be the self. And the self presents itself in many different ways, like when we play board games with small children and desperately try to win, when the phone's ringing and we just have to answer it because it could be important, when we change lanes in traffic jams even though we 
are aware of that eternal law that the lane we have just joined will now move more slowly than the lane we just left. And we're all born with self on the throne of our hearts. The self demands to be number one. And serving the self, it leads to many problems, and one of the greatest is worry. Okay? Okay? The self, it makes demands on our lives. It places desires in our hearts, but it's limited to fulfill these plans and desires, and therefore we worry. And friends, I want you to know that worry is in direct opposition to the fruits of the Spirit. You and I, we can't, you know, show love and joy and peace and patience when worry is present because the self, well, how can I love somebody else if I'm not being loved? Or how can I be patient when that person's in my way? Or... It, it, it just messes up the whole spiritual system. And what did Jesus say is the one thing that chokes the word? The cares of this world. It's in Matthew 13. And sometimes it's the big worries, but how many times is it the little worries that get us? You know, last Saturday night we had some car problems. Saturday night, it was my prime sermon prep time, five and a half hours, standing next to a car, so I consoled my wife, listen, in a couple of days, we're not even going to remember this until two days ago when we got the $1,000 bill. <clears throat> <laughs> but what we need to do is differentiate between what's an inconvenience and what's really worth worrying about. You know, somebody squeezes in line ahead of you at the movies. That's ah, an inconvenience. Somebody takes your parking space. It's an inconvenience. You get a flat tire on the road on the way to the airport. An inconvenience. Your kid takes an extra year to graduate. An inconvenience. The Dow falls below 8,000 and you lose 40% of the value of your 401k. Or your company's being acquired and you're probably going to lose your job. This too is an inconvenience. Compared to the father who was in the hospital dying and he said, you know, of all the problems I've faced, nothing's compared to this. I'd give everything I've had, all the money I've earned, to acquire more time to be with you. Suddenly our priorities get straightened out. You know, friends, 40% of what we worry about never happens. 30% of what we worry about already happened. You know, 12% is unfounded criticism of others. 10% is our health. We actually have about 8% of things to worry about. Listen to me. 92% of the things we worry about are useless. And the 8% worrying doesn't seem to help at all. I mean, Jesus said, who can even add an, an hour to your life by worrying? The only place perpetual worry gets you ahead of time is into the cemetery. And really to worry is to miss the point of life. Jesus says, don't worry about your life, what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat. You know, these items are actually daily concerns to billions of people on this planet. For us Americans, even the poorest of poor have access to food, medicine, shelter. Actually, we Americans, you know, we worry about managing our money. We fret over what might interfere with our pleasure pursuits or impede the American dream in our life. The Times columnist Penny Parrick writes, I was at the store wandering around the sales racks thinking about what I wanted. What I want is true love, long eyelashes, smaller feet. You can't buy those at Harrods. Well, actually, I saw an ad for plastic surgeons who will perform surgery on your toes to make them more attractive, okay? They will even desensitize the soles of your feet to enable you to wear uncomfortable shoes. Think about that. And, I mean, everybody's got worries. The, the rich worry about losing what they have. The poor worry because we don't have enough. Uh, the old worry because they're facing death. The young worry because they're facing life. Blessed is the man who is too busy to worry in the daytime and too sleepy to worry at night. And here's the problem. A problem not worth praying about is not worth worrying about. Or 
Today is the tomorrow you worried about yesterday. Think about that, okay? And here's what makes worry so problematic. This casual activity that we all engage in is actually a sin. In Oswald Chambers' devotional, our utmost for his highest, he writes, Worry always results in sin. Oh, we think a little worry is simply an indication of how wise we are. Actually, it's an indicator of how wicked we are. Fretting rises from our determination to have our own way. And worry is the idea that our circumstances are too much for God to handle. Friends, worry is the opposite of faith. And Jesus comes along and he says, do not worry. And I've always kind of saw that statement as, you know, good advice on how to live life. Well, actually, he says it three times, which puts it in the uh, category of sin. Okay? Now I've just added one more sin for you to worry about, okay? Jesus says, do not worry. I want you to understand, you can choose to worry or you can choose not to worry. Our outside circumstances don't cause someone to worry. Worry comes from within. It's a choice. This one particular man had acquired information that killers become killers for two reasons. One, difficulty at birth being delivered. And two, they were rejected by their mother. It said, if forceps were used on you when you were born, you have a higher likelihood to kill people one day. Well, the guy comes into the pastor and says, you know, pastor, uh, when I was born, the doctors used forceps. Now I'm worried that I'm a murderer. Well, come on. Predispositions, it's a choice. Are you going to follow the Lord and allow him to lead your life? Or are you going to worry about things and then turn it into a self-fulfilling prophecy? Friends, worry reveals a lack of trust in God. It's a sin to not trust God's promises to you. Worry means we don't believe that God can look after the practical details of our lives. This world has trained us to place our faith in material things. Christians should put their faith in the Heavenly Father. You have a choice. I can live in the natural realm or I can live in the supernatural realm. I don't know if you've heard of the place called Perfect, where there are no automobile accidents, no disabling diseases, no overdue bills, rebellious teenagers, jobs you hate, jobs you lose, cars that break down, houses that need painting, long-winded preachers. Your dinner is cooked just right, on time, every time. The place called Perfect. Uh, We don't live there, because sometimes our cars don't work. We worry, am I going to get sick? Am I going to get fired? What about the bills, my spouse, my kids? You know, sometimes we worry about not making it to work on time, so we speed, get pulled over by a police officer, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now we're going to be late. Friends, you and I, we live in a fallen world where there is corruption. We have lots of financial pressures on us. It's a materialistic society. We have legitimate worries. So, the solution It's Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Instead of worrying, turn it into prayer. Again, three times, Jesus says, do not worry. He redirects us to channel our thoughts away from bad thoughts to good thoughts. Actually, to God thoughts. Okay? Think of God's greatness. Nothing is impossible with God. When you pray about something, He can make it happen. He's so intimately acquainted with us that He knows the exact amount of grace to extend to us. And by the way, you have a divine warranty upon you. He's prepared a home for us in heaven with him. And I have an old book, The Sins of the Saints, and I was shocked to see that that worry, it's not simply a weakness, it's a wickedness. Why? Well, first of all, what a poor testimony for the Christians in the world to, you know, we have the promises of God and, you know what, we still worry about everything. And really, what does it say to God? Because worry is slandering God's character. 
I mean, if he cares for the birds and, and knows when each one of them falls to the ground, surely you who have been made in his image is much more valuable. You know, on Thursday nights, we're going through uh, Isaiah right now. We were doing the chapters 40s, the 40 chapters. And uh, it's kind of cool. In chapter 43, he says, when you go through the waters, you will not drown. When you go through the fire, you will not get burned. You are mine. You are precious. I love you. Then he closes up in chapter 49. I have inscribed you on the palm of my hand. This is how God feels about you. You know, there was a man working on a barge in the Mississippi River, and he was carrying something and fell overboard, and he cried out, help, as he went under. And then he came up and cried out, help, again. Then he went back under, and he came up a third time and said, if someone doesn't help me, I'm going to have to drop these anvils. (laughs) I wonder how many of us have a load of cares under each arm that are causing us to sink. Okay? Okay. It's not the way God wanted you to go through life. No no wonder we're going under. Friends, you and I have to get a hold of this bad habit of worry because life is too precious. You know, many people approach life as if it was a dress rehearsal for the real thing. But in fact, by tonight, you will have given the only performance of today that you will ever give. Okay? Okay? It's time for you and I to grab a hold of every day and live it with joy and confidence and purpose because God is with you and God is for you. This is the day that the Lord has made. But let's be honest, sometimes it's hard to mustard seed up a little bit of faith. Let's take fog, for instance. Fog is kind of a scary thing. It obscures our vision. It causes accidents. You know how much water is actually in fog? Seven city blocks could be covered in fog, 100 feet deep, and that would take eight ounces of water. Can you believe that? And actually worry, it's it's a thick fog that settles in and it shuts us down, but there's really nothing to it. Here's why. The second Chronicles 16.9, the eyes of the Lord move to and fro, seeking to strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. This is the promise that God has made to you. I am for you. Focus on the Father. He's not asking to have a prominent place in your life. He wants a preeminent place. He wants to be the center and the focus so that he can dictate your happiness and your purpose. And this is the deal he makes. You take care of my business and I'll take care of your business. You know, psychologists tell us there are three major wants in life. The first is comfort, you know, food when we're hungry, drink when we're thirsty, shelter from the storm. The second is we want to be accepted by our peers. How many of us worry about what other people are going to think? We, we worry about, am I perfect enough? There was an evening service and the preacher said, Jesus is the only sinless one that ever lived. Does anybody else here know of a perfect person? And the man in the back raised his hand. He said, I hear a lot about my wife's sister's husband. <laughs> Friends, you don't have to worry about being perfect. Jesus did that for you. And the only perfection that God acknowledges is when we we allow his spirit to move through us. You know, the third major want in humanity is to find meaning in life, to understand what it's all about. And, And you and I, we want to play a part in this. I found something fascinating. John Quincy Adams, he held more offices than anyone else in the history of the United States. He served as president, senator, congressman, minister to major European powers. He participated in various capacities in the American Revolution, the War of 1812, and the events leading up to the Civil War. And yet at age 70, he wrote, My whole life has been a succession of disappointments. I can scarcely recollect a single instance of success in anything I ever undertook. Wow. You know why he feels this way? Because when Jesus isn't at the center of your life, you don't know what your purpose is. And you're always striving and and hoping and worrying and unsatisfied. That's why the Lord says, seek first his kingdom, 
His righteousness. And what that means is His reign and rule in your life, in your marriage, your home, your lifestyle, in the lives of your friends and neighbors and work colleagues. Remember the story of Wilbur, William Wilberforce? He, for 43 years, fought against slavery. And three days before he died, they passed the law to abolish slavery. And I read that story and I go, wow. His life was focused on bringing God's power and healing into the world. What is our life focused on? Is it all about me and what's in it for me? Or, or do you?